Thank you uh, for this film to show us. Uh, maybe the first question that uh, I can ask you, uh, what? Uh, the, this Biennale of Cuba uh, is very interesting because uh, in, before the beginning, I think, uh, this Biennale is always for the people. Uh, and you just uh, catch the idea of the people and uh, you make this film, I think. Uh, can you uh, maybe uh, tell us uh, what was the process of this film during the Biennale in the beginning? Please. Well, um, the, the Biennial is, um, interesting because it's the first they obviously had a, a project uh, for this biennial that dealt with the interaction of the public with art. And what we did was um, different than all the artists that came that year because we took it outside the neighborhoods where the biennial usually happens. And we went all over the neighborhoods where people would not expect us to be. And we put a mural pretty much in different places that uh, where people usually don't have access to art very easily. So we really took it somewhere where they didn't expect it and we got the people involved in a way that it had never happened before especially in the history of a country that in 57 years there is no advertising you're not used to seeing any photographs on walls the way we are in our society and you have only propaganda yeah my co oh, crazy <laughs> I live in the future, man. I just, I don't need a microphone. I'm sorry about that. It's because he's French. For the Cubans, you gotta give me... <laughs> the, fun, no, the funny thing, when you get to Cuba, the one thing they're afraid of you to bring in is not like your iPhone or like some iPad stuff. Is If you bring on a talkie-walkie, walkie-talkie. Walkie-talkie. Yeah. They're like, yo, yeah, don't bring that shit here. Um, and any camera that has um, the microphone, a type yeah. of microphone on it, they take the microphone yeah. away. We spent months trying to get microphones and equipment back. We snuck things in and we snuck movies out and things that, you know, because it's still a communist place where they restrict from, you know, from you doing certain things. Um, but on, on, yeah, on the, on, the, on, the, um, on the stuff you were saying on the, the Biennale, is, uh, what's interesting there is, I think without the frame of the Biennale, people would have been much more scared to participate to the project because they've never seen any other portrait than Che Fidel or Raul. And so they needed to know in which, you know, in, in which frame this was integrated. And as soon as, you know, they would come in the street and they would say, who is that? And and then we saw it's just, you know, Jose, he live around the corner, it's just that guy. Um, they would be really scared. And then as soon as we would tell them, you, you know, this is part of the Biennale, it would reassure them. Like if art was an umbrella where a little bit more could be done uh, in a frame that is not the, you know, the really rigid frame they were living in. Uh, apparently, uh, they all know the, what is the Vienna. Because uh, everywhere in the world, uh, the people doesn't know the Vienna. It is... Uh... Cuba is... Um, the people in Cuba, the education is very strong. And culture is also a very high point there. Artists, musicians, um, creative people are pretty, pretty much valued in the highest level of society. And just regular people are very poetic and they wanted to sort of join in every moment that they could in anything that we were doing. And every day we were surprised by just anyone coming up to us, young, old, saying the most beautiful things um, about art. And they all knew about the biennial. It's something that is promoted pretty much for everyone to participate on some level. Um, and uh, for us, it was interesting because on so many le levels, we were able to communicate directly with people. And at some level, the, the government tried to stop you from doing that. They wanted to have us uh, do specific people in an elderly home. And a lot of the interviews and photographs that we took, we took much earlier than that they knew we were doing. So we were doing things outside of the line a little bit. Um, but uh, they loved it at the end. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, a, it's a, I guess out there was the way of, of functioning. You, you think you have freedom, it's actually all under control. And uh, I guess, yeah, I guess, you know, for us, the, the, the fact that we could work directly with the people 
and choosing the people you know that we would randomly met because all those people we actually literally randomly met the the the, the couple you see mm-hmm. you know we were just walking going to a restaurant where we wanted to have food and and we saw them on the way we thought they had style so we just stop and and you know and and snap a photo but just with our phone and then when we were eating we were like whoa we should really find those people <laughs> we spent the next day we spent an entire afternoon searching for them we didn't know where where they lived and then we heard that um the husband that he's a musician and that he played down in a square or in front of a church and we walked and we walked and we spent hours till we found him and he was playing a little cajon it's a it's a little box called marimbula and he's just sitting on top of it with his friends playing music and then we convinced them to let us you know take their photos so they could participate in the project and the way we would do it we cross pollinated each other jr would explain my art i would explain his art and they found it uh, interesting at one point, and we would convince people. We asked at least 30 people, and only one person said no. Yeah. And I think that was a little bit of a fear that something... Why? You know, I don't know. I think that in a, com- in, in, in a communist place, there's still fear. You know, people don't want to say the wrong thing. They're very careful. The words they choose. And I think our approach was very open, very free, and we also thought that most interesting is what they're not talking about. Mm. So if you look at linearly what they were saying, you also start to think, what is it that they did not say in a place that there's a lot to say? So, you know, it paints a different picture when you think behind the lines. Also, it takes a lot of courage to have your photo. You know, not everyone want to have you, his photo up on the wall at the size, you know, of a building. And so uh, most of the time it comes, you know, from personal reason. There's also something interesting is maybe for a generation, you know, having your photo big in the street is accomplishing something, is existing for a moment, is, you know, is, is whatever success or... Uh, but for their generation in this project, and I've experienced it in different countries, they have another distance with their image, you know. It doesn't mean that much on the wall. The book means a lot for them. We came back a year later with the book and organized a big thing for all of them. And that for them was like better than anything we done in the city because that's legacy. That's what you give to your children. That's what will stay. That's ephemeral on the wall. Even if the pieces are still there, we were there a couple of months ago. Most of them are still up. But um, you know, it's interesting for elderly people how you know they they approach imagery and uh, and they, they they don't see it as a you know this sacred thing. And how many days you passed there uh, to to realize this project? Well, um, we arrived on a Sunday, for example, and early in the morning, we had lunch and straight away, we, uh, we decided we, we should start. How we can start was the question. We didn't have subjects. You had the idea. To, uh, we had the go. idea. The, yeah. the idea, JR came yeah, with the JR. idea from uh, Cartagena, Spain and Shanghai. We decided to collaborate in Havana because the walls also have a similar dialogue to the work we both do. They're from Cuba. Yes. And um, so... We decided to start and we started with a neighbor in the building where we were staying and while we were doing that we saw another guy walking by we said wow look at his face it's beautiful let's talk to him and when we were talking to him a woman walked by oh let's talk to her so we continuously did it like that very randomly we, yeah, we would drive in the city and search for elderly people you know <laughs> like also, guys yeah. searching for women but we would look for elderly people oh stop the car stop the car and the nice right. thing is you have this time to stop, park, and then, you know, they still walk They walk the so corner. slow, you can catch them. But it's funny because our driver just thought we were crazy because yeah. a group of guys goes to Havana. They usually spend the whole time partying. Yeah. We, we spend the whole time chasing old people, interviewing them. They, they were looking at us like, what are these guys doing? They couldn't believe it, you know? <laughs> uh, what was the idea to, to choose just, the, especially the old persons? Is to choose the, the old people is to to look at history in a in a special way. We're comparing the 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 history on the face with the walls. The walls have their wrinkles, the cracks, the history, the layers of paint. The years pass by, the experiences. I guess you know, especially in such you know delicate place where politics is so present. Um, the only way to get into certain subject is to people that have actually the respect of the years and and 
and I've been I've, I've done it in China or in Spain or in, even in, in Los Angeles where the wrinkles are really hard to find because everyone try to hide their wrinkles oh. there. But in in Cuba, what was interesting is you know in a way, elderly people have more right to kind of cross the subjects, and they've also seen a time when there was not you know where there was you know different angles of politics, and and that was pretty interesting. Even though we thought that they didn't, you know, they, they, they would really keep the interviews on their life, on their personal story, on, you know, the different way of presenting it, but they would never get politics into it. I mean, you got to remember that these are, the, this is the generation that saw Cuba before the revolution. Yeah. And, you know, most of them were born in the early 1900s, and they lived through several dictators also, and they saw coup d'etat happening twice before Fidel Castro. They also saw the heyday of like the glory days of Havana, you know, when everybody was coming there to, it was like casinos, you know? And, uh, so it was really the last opportunity, I think, at this point to capture that story in an artistic way. Yes, uh, your works uh, together, uh, uh, are always about the mural painting, but uh, you you use the photography and you use the calligraphy and uh, also and painting, the yeah. pa painting. Uh, what was this? Uh, what this collaboration uh, uh, get you to to, 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 to go to, to cooperate together uh, in Cuba? And do you think that you will continue to, to be together for other projects? We both started out very young. Um, painting in, in, in the city. We started out documenting JR in, in Paris and me in Miami and uh, later on in New York, painting streets, painting walls. So we already had many years of having that part of uh, who we are as our fiber as artists. And uh, both separately have always been in, involved in projects that deal with the city, the history of the city, what it, what it means. What does a wall mean to you? Some people walk right by a wall and it's nothing. So people take the time to look at the layers of a wall. It's very psychological, it's psychogeographical. There's a lot of stories on the walls and uh, that goes back to, to the ancient days. And so I think that for us, it was very natural to do this collaboration. It started out by not even thinking we were gonna collaborate. We thought, let's do a trade as friends of one another's artwork. And we still, to this point, haven't done the trade. It's been a few years since the project, but we did, you know, the conversation just grew. You know, and uh, we, we're brothers, so we collaborate just by being here, you know, and we're going to continue. Yeah, maybe, maybe in Paris. Maybe in Paris, maybe in Istanbul, Istanbul. who knows? Uh, uh, concerning the Benal of Havana, I remember uh, because of the embargo of uh, states, yeah. uh, French uh, government uh, helps always to to help for the, for the sponsoring the catalogs. And the, it, it was always, I think, uh, French and uh, Spanish the catalogs. Uh, it is the current way, or uh, it, it is just uh, sometimes when the French uh, government uh, sponsor is uh, right, the... Uh, you know, on, the, the, on this project, we, we didn't have any sponsors. Uh, the French government actually helped our flight. I think we got one or two flights, uh, but... Um, the, 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 the Cuba Biennale had no you know budget. So the deal we made with them is like, let us finance it through the sales of our artwork, but we want to have all control on it. And so that's the deal we made. So we went, did a first trip together, scout worlds, and uh, we just go through the city and be like that world, that world, like you see in the beginning of the movie. And then we didn't took the portrait that time, I think. I don't remember, but we gave them all the walls. And you know, we, we, like, did, we, we, did, we took the we portraits. Took, we took some other. Well, we okay. did. We took some portraits, and what we did is, um, you know, they were they were really concerned that we were coming to do something political. And so what we did, we did some mock-ups of the walls, the exact walls we wanted, and we gave them an idea of what the artwork would look like. And um, they gave us all the walls, except for two. Yeah, which we never understood why, but that's yeah. the you know, <laughs> which was like a, the end of a parking lot and of a basketball playground. Not even one of the best walls, but we never got why it was impossible. We tried every way we couldn't get those. But once they agreed on like, okay, you can have those walls, and it took like maybe a month or two, we said, okay, now we, you know, let's plan the trip, let's print everything. The the, the funny thing is that the logistic of it is is 
the hardest part. It's not painting under the sun with amazing people who just bring you coffee and tea all the time. It's really the logistics because you cannot get a ladder there. You cannot get a brush. So we flew everything out there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then sometimes France, we, actually, yeah, because from the United States, the paperwork would have been tremendously crazy and it would have just packed us up for, for months. So we sent an entire crate uh, from Paris yeah. to Havana. And when you see the, 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 what is it? the cherry picker, we, we, we didn't have cherry picker. We would stop cherry pickers in the street and be like, Yo, guys, that was the guy we, from the electric yeah. company. He was like, they're like we government workers. It. And they can get in a lot of trouble to let us use the truck, but you have to pay a little extra money. So when they finish their, their, their journey, they, they, walk, they, they walk, they will come and help us finish our wall. Mm -hmm. You speak in the film uh, some, sometimes in French uh, to correct the... Uh, yeah, yeah, some of, uh, of the team was French, <coughs> that's why. Uh, maybe uh, you have some uh, questions of, to our friends? Yes? Uh, microphone one, my job. Okay, I can start. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you said at the beginning that the walls were empty, except the political uh, ads. Uh, would you choose a, a city, because it's not the first time in Havana that you exhibited, uh, would you choose a wall, city uh, with walls full of ads and you know, graffitis and everything. This is the first question. The second one is, are you chosen by the curators or you pick up your own cities to exhibit? Uh, I mean, on, on, on the first question, if I understood well, it, it, it's, uh, uh, did we walk there because there was already graffiti and, and, and life no, on the, the, the You said the walls were empty, except uh, the political figures. Yeah, no, there was no... The Would you choose, for example, Istanbul, which is full of legal or illegal uh, graffitis and ads and advertisements? We've been looking yeah. at Istanbul yeah. since we got here, planning, looking, searching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're natural like that. We're this, on the way, Jose was telling me, you know why it could be hard here, there's logos everywhere. But you know why, that's, you know, it's... Uh, it's a frame of work where we have to walk around. And uh, I've even done walk in Times Square in New York. It's not impossible, it's just I use the floor instead of using the walls. Mm -hmm. So you play around that. I think, you know, as artists, you, you need constraint. The funny thing there is even if there's no advertising and, and there's no graffiti, when you look deep in the wall, you see that people engrave their name everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's that feeling like everyone wants to feel that they leave a mark behind them, that they've existed. And so, you know, maybe out there they don't call it graffiti, but still, when you look, you, you find, you know, little name and the year, and we find some of those all over. And I was just uh, walking in Paris in, a, 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 in the Pantheon, a really old monument, and when I woke up, you know, to the back doors and stuff like that, I found, <coughs> you know, writing done in pencil from 1800. And, and, you know, just people writing their name. It's not like we call it street art, graffiti, you know, in the last 20 years, but these have been existed <laughs> forever. They just had no cans at the time. They were just using pencil. <laughs> and then on the second question um, uh, well, about the curators. You, you don't mind choosing a, wall, uh, cho choosing a city with uh, empty walls or full walls or anything? That's I mean, I, you know, I went to, no, no, I, we don't mind, of course not. I, I went to North Korea uh, last year. There's really no graffiti there, like whatsoever, <laughs> and actually they were not ready for anything up on the wall. So you know, sometimes you know we choose our cities, but sometimes the ch cities don't want us. Yeah, we worked with the curators in Havana yeah. because of the ha Havana Biennale. We were invited, but there's things that we do just on our own that have nothing to do with any program or project or exhibition. Sometimes you just do things randomly at the same time. Street art has always fascinated me because it's probably the only art form there is no boundary between the public and the artist. For example, let's take, for instance, film. You need a distributor, you need a movie theater, you know, people need to pay money to get in there, or other artworks are shown at museums, you need a curator, you need to pass to the next level to get your work exhibited. 
But I always wondered in the start, what drives you to go out to the streets or basically take over the streets and perform and show your art there? What's, what's, what's the inner drive? Where does it come from? Uh, you know, I think we started very young, you know, and um, I think it's just the drive to want to be artists at such an early age. I mean, JR and I both were like nine, 10 years old, totally focused, figured out we wanted to be artists. And we come from places that the resources weren't there. We weren't going to museums. We weren't at art schools at that early age. So we looked at walls as a place to communicate, but we were lucky that there were already, like you say, like godfathers from New York City that had already you know, started the, they, they laid the, the path down for us. So when you look at the history of something like Philadelphia uh, writing on the walls and in New York City in the 1970s, guys like Phase Two, Case, all these legendary New York guys who painted the subways, we started looking at that because we could relate that it was the same type of neighborhood, the places we're coming from. The resources was at that time, you steal the paint. You didn't have any money, you go and get paint, you go paint walls, and you put your message out there. You, your, your need to express yourself at that time was happening in an explosive, phenomenal way. Breakdancing, writing on walls, DJing, inventing, reinventing, sharing. So it was a total subcultural phenomenon that happened without a manifesto. Nobody was writing rules, but the rules sort of came out of the ether. And we all started to respect and share. Yeah, it was this complete mutual phenomenon that we are actually a part of by generation, like we had people pass ideas down, and we looked at things and we got inspired, you know, and it's still happening. And at that time, no one was calling it graffiti art or street art, we called ourselves writers. And it was so underground that people were still looking at you like you're a piece of dirt, you know? I remember by the time I was 16, I got a scholarship and I was surprised because I wasn't even interested in continuing to study. I was like, I'm gonna just do painting on my own, my art, teacher pulled me aside and said, I have something serious to show you. It was a scholarship to a, a, a very good art school. And I, my parents were shocked. Everybody was like, wow. All right, so I took off. And then I took the traditional training, but I never forgot the roots that was so embedded and so strong in what I wanted to do, that I took the education, but I didn't forget the streets. And I brought it back in. And I think JR had the same kind of passion. Yeah, no, I, I guess at that time is really you have all those advertising, you know, it was before we had social media and everything and you, you had more, the, the, that's really the period where advertising were becoming more and more present. As a kid, you just want to exist in the city. You just want to, you know, have your name out there. And which is funny when you think about it, it's like being your own brand. You just want to exist in the city. Um, then slowly, I guess, and that's what we have in common, we, we, we switched that into making other people exist, you know, and, and Jose through the story he tells on walls and it's really abstract. It's not like writing his name is, is, you know, writing a language and myself by, you know, putting other people photography and, and not signing them. And, uh, and, and then we find something more interesting that creates, you know, dialogue. Cause it's funny, you do that in a vandal way and, and you have to escape and, and, and hide yourself. And at the same time, you, you're looking for interaction because, you know, any artist, kind of looking for interaction you create for someone else and uh, and in the street you have so much of that that you, you you became dependent of it and then so then you you know you're inside a gallery and 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 you have less of that so that's why we've always documented our work we've always walked differently in galleries to kind of try and pass what we've lived out there but there's some work that are in the street that you know no one can own them they're just there and and no one can secure how long they're going to stay to and so I, I like that ephemeral part of it, that you never own things. And, and the city have been an amazing canvas for that. And the works outside, they only exist really through photography or film afterwards, because after time, it's disappeared. It starts to fade away. And people also paint it over all the people, so your work would get crossed out. And, and you know, it would have like a sporadic germination of life and death of art that was happening by thousands of kids in the city. And then it started to spread city to city in the United States, it went to Paris, it went to Australia, Japan. It's been, a, it's, it's been an incredible phenomenon. And people always say, when did you guys make the transition from the street to the gallery? And the funny thing is, is that there was never a transition because we were only interested in art. And we kept sketchbooks and we kept documenting. And the fact that the galleries happened, that's okay, but it wasn't the ultimate goal. But we saw it as a necessary um, thing that would help to establish the culture. I mean. We weren't the first, you had Keith Haring and 
Jean Michel Gasquet, people like that already started to, you know. And, and if you think about those two guys, especially, especially they weren't part of the, the underground guys that were painting the subway trains with wild style and the, and the lettering. They were artists already who sought to use the street to advertise their work. That the way that Keith Haring would paint inside the subways stations, he painted on the placards where you would put the advertisings. And John Michel was would writing messages all over so people could interact with him. And all those things all started to make the history and we started to see how our work could fit inside the history as well. Yes. Should I need to perform a little bit, please? Okay, what will happen? Good luck to you. Hello. Um, I, my question is about something totally different, kind of. Uh, I am following JR from Instagram. And the way I came here was this morning, I just woke up and I, I found your post of, you know, the, the, the moon <laughs> yesterday. And then I saw uh, you were coming to Istanbul 74 from, and then I reached to your, po your account. And then I, I found out about all these events and then I came. And this social me media, I think, is something just like the street art because it's one to one. Yeah, definitely. And so uh, I'm just curious about how you are using social media in relation with your art. I mean, you know, I've I've discovered uh, social media only recently, maybe two three years ago. Uh, before I would never do it, and I would receive tons of emails that I could never really answers of people who say we want to have, we want to paste, and my work is based on actually also volunteering and people who come and paste, but it would always be hard to connect everyone. And since I'm using this platform on my website too, there's a map where you can log in and you just say where you are in the world and when we go there, we always you know send an email to everyone. I use those techniques and Instagram a lot to actually connect with people directly. Most of the time there's always someone living you know, a window that can see a walk, uh, you know, we're doing in the street. And it's funny because that person says, hey, I can see you from my window. And I reply, oh, where's your window? Come and pick me up. I go to your house and take a photo from there. And I visited so many apartments and rooftop just like that. And when I arrive in places and we need people, we say, oh, meet us tomorrow at six on the main square. And, and you know, that's how we gather people sometimes for pastings. It's been a direct way to actually interact and, uh, and also discover and follow other artists. So. I, I, I use it on a daily basis and I really like try to keep a, a, a real life like uh, instance so that if something's happening today I would you know we try to put it on the, on the day before but really uh, you know we were eating last night and then doing that photo together with Jose just before it started we just it just happened naturally and then it spread but I see on Instagram how people actually tag other people and so I'm sure I don't know how many people from Turkey were following but then they connect to other people and it's growing like that and you know it's a fabulous thing because it's like your direct own media yes we went to the for the Pantheon and the New York City Ballet do you choose it yourself or are you do you, is there a high demand now because you your work is more appreciated I don't know you know I, I you know my side I, I, I start projects and then um, then I would walk, I start maybe two or three projects at a time. When I close the project, it's over. I never go back to it. Like Women Are Heroes, you know, even if there's amazing cities around the world where I could do it, that's it. I've, I've loved it. But when I have an open-up project like Inside Out or Because of the City, then if a proposition comes from a city and it feels, you know, in, then I would do it. Uh, then for New York City Ballet, that was different. They contacted me and, you know, I've never went to the ballet before, I never choreographed the ballet, and suddenly I get a walk with the entire company choreographing a ballet that was just on stage. For me then, I see that more as a challenge. I was like, okay, I don't know anything about it, I get nothing to lose anyway. And so I would jump in and, you know, and try to learn from it. But the way we approached the project in Havana, for example, is, you know, when they proposed, we were like, oh, you know, that can suit a great collaboration because it really fits in what we're doing. We don't have to force or to invent something. More this is there. And so we Very just, organic. Yeah, really organic. Pardon. Biliyorum kadar iyi giden bir sohbeti böyle bir yapacaksınız ama zamanınıza sadık kalmak için son bir soru rica edebilir miyiz lütfen? Ben soru sormayacağım ama 
I'm not going to uh, ask you uh, um, any questions because what I've seen in the, in the film and what I heard from QA, that's pretty enough for me. And the wife that I got from you too, that's pretty enough. But I want to thank you for, uh, as, as a profession myself, I will probably walk out from here and I will never look at the wall as, as used to. And, um, mm -hmm. Uh, bringing those old people faces to the uh, matching into the uh, uh, old neighborhood in the Cuba and uh, now uh, just complementing the old like a back to the future future to the back type and, and the history and I don't know everything was there I want to thank you for coming to Turkey and, and thank thanks you, for thank your you. gift thank, thank you for sharing with us thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.